Hi, I'm Carol McMullen. I'm going to be presenting to you today a program on gardening in the shade. I am a North Fulton Master Gardener and the Master Gardener program is through the UGA Extension, uh, specifically in Fulton County. To give you a little bit of background, um, I think I was meant to be a gardener. I'm meant to be a biology teacher. I've been a master gardener now for seven years. I uh, taught biology for 35. Um, I just love to play in the dirt and I've been an avid gardener as a result of that for my entire life. Gardening in the shade has been part of that gardening, not initially, but out of um, requirement. When I bought a house 37 years ago with my husband in Pennsylvania, the house was in the woods. So I had to figure out if I like gardening, how to get around that, what I thought was a disadvantage, which we'll go into disadvantages and advantages of, of shade gardening soon. Um, I also spend part of my time volunteering at Assistance League of Atlanta, who has a thrift shop in Chambly. I am going to um, introduce this gardening in the shade and, and entice you to explore the options for your shade garden. Take a look at this beautiful picture here. This is what you can create. Take a look. We're going to see um, all the components that are in here. You can see there's a, a shrub here, trees here, perennials, annuals, all these things make this shade garden work. And so we're going to take shade gardening, which some of you may question, but it's definitely an opportunity. What is our outline for today? I've decided to divide it into about six different areas. The first thing I want to talk about is shade. I'm going to define what shade is, and we're going to talk about shade during the season, shades during various times of the day, and during various times of the year. Then we're going to talk about, of course, as I just mentioned, what is the advantage of shade? And what is the disadvantages of shade? And in that shade environment, of course, the plants have to grow. And they may have clay to grow in, or they may have humus. And so we're going to talk about how you get around soil that may not be the best type of soil to grow your plants. We'll be talking about amending that soil. And then we'll be talking about what kinds of shade in situations you might end up with. There is something called dry shade. We'll talk about why you can have a combination of shade and dry and why you can have a combination of shade and wet and how you work around those two different types of shade. As I mentioned, when we talked about soil, it's hard not to talk about amending the soil if you're gonna talk about soil. So I should probably have moved that up one notch. And then of course, the part that I think everybody really enjoys when they when we talk about shade gardening is the components. What are those components? Of course, you've got your trees, you've got shrubs, what kind of shrubs grow in shade, what kind of trees, what kind of perennials, and what kind of annuals. So that gives you an idea of what we're going to be discussing. Well, first of all, if this is shade gardening, we've got to talk about what is shade. I love pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Take a look at that tree. Look at that shade. That's the most obvious kind of shade, but that is not the only type of shade. Mother Nature creates shade and so does humans, so do humans. There's man-made shadows that come from buildings, particularly on the north side, um, building overhangs, walls. Um, I have um, a fence, a, a natural fence between my house and the house next door of Leland spruce and they create a lot of shade. So there's um, hedges and fences and other things. Also, some of you may be uh, in a new subdivision. And when you're in a new subdivision, oftentimes the builder comes in, he levels the ground and makes it flat as a pancake, takes every single tree out. And there you think, oh my gosh, I don't have any shade. I shouldn't even be listening to this. Well, take, take, take the time, listen to me because you definitely have shade, even though you don't think you do. What, how do you read these plant tags? Let's take a look at a plant. One of my companions on my um, presentation here. Notice this is something whenever you buy a plant, they often tell you, you know, that you need 
full sun. Well, what does that mean? Are you partial sun, partial shade, and so forth? So we're going to explore that. All right, what is full sun? Full sun means there's six hours of sun. That means it's unrelenting. It's out there. It's, you know, that poor plant is not getting a moment of peace. It's, it's that bright sunshine that you see over there on the screen is going to be there pretty much all day long. Then you have partial sun, and these plants do get a little bit relief from the sun. That is pretty ideal in this Georgia environment that we live in. They get a little relief from the sun. That means they're getting four to six hours of sun. Now, this is a shade presentation, so let's go down to shade. Partial shade, what's partial shade? That's two to four hours of sun. So we're diminishing the amount of sun. That sun's still up there. Those plants are still getting the sun. They have to get the sun because there's something called photosynthesis and they need the sun. That's the source of energy. Without the sun, there is no earth, there are no plants, there are no humans, there are no nothing. So they're taking advantage of a little bit of sun that they get. But now you're down in the shade. What is the shade? That is when there's very, very little sun. There's only two hours of sun. And there actually are plants that can thrive in that environment where they're getting very, very little sun. And we're going to be talking about those. So you may have a combination, probably everybody has a combination of those in their uh, environment. Let's talk about what's on the screen here. Um, different seasons, the sun is going to be high on the horizon, of course, in the summer. In the spring, it's pretty much you know, high up, but not as high up as you can see on the screen. And then when we get to the winter, the winter, you know, the sun is going to be at a different angle and you're going to have a lot more shade. And um, of course, even though um, in some years, Georgia doesn't really have much of a winter, you're still not going to get a lot of growth because the sun is not shining. Plants love the spring. Okay, the sun's up there, the trees have shed their leaves, and now it's hallelujah time. The sun's up there, it's time to grow. And these shade plants that don't get a lot of sunlight in the summer, they are, you know, happy campers now because now they have some more sun, that means more growth. In the summertime, the sun is higher up on the horizon, but those trees are shading those plants or whatever, you know, you have on your buildings or whatever. But more sun means more growth. And so that's the most important thing on that slide. More sun, more shade, more growth. Um, I like, again, pictures. Pictures do give us um, an understanding of this shade. As the seasons change, let's look at May. Okay, notice that there are openings for the sun to filter through. The plants are growing. Here's winter, it's colder out. Um, the trees have shed their leaves, but you know, the sun is not in the right position. They're not getting a lot of sunlight. You can see there's very little growth here and notice all the shade. There's a lot more shade. Time of the day, okay? You know that when you get up early in the morning, the sun is not as high up in the sky and therefore those plants are not getting as much sun. Try 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That sun is up there, you know, providing the rays of sun that makes those plants grow. Now, um, everybody needs a homework assignment. You need to go around your house. You need to go around at different times of the day and look for those shadows. Look for the shadows that are created by trees, the most obvious. Look at the buildings, how they create. Look at the vegetation that's already there. Check it out, that is your assignment. If you wanna be a successful shade gardener, you have to observe. Observation is very important as I can tell you as a former teacher of science. All right, let's take a typical garden. These are pictures that were taken by a master gardener. This is her home at eight o'clock in the morning. Notice the shade. The sun is not high on the horizon yet. Those plants are getting some sun. They're saying, okay, it's been nighttime. It's time to start carrying on photosynthesis and making uh, food and growing. And notice now it's 11 o'clock. Look at the difference. There's hardly any shadows. Now those plants have a lot more opportunities to grow. Now by four o'clock, look, look at that difference. I mean, it's phenomenal, the difference between 12 and four. Look at all those shadows. By seven, there's even more shadows. The sun's still up there, but 
you know, it's going down on the horizon, and so therefore there's not as much sunlight. Now that you all have some understanding of what shade is, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, advantages, what could the advantages be? Well, when I ended up with that house in the woods, I had to figure out what in the world are the advantages. Well, first of all, if you plant the plants, they grow slowly. Well, that could also be a disadvantage. They grow slowly and they're not gonna be invasive. They're not gonna take over wherever you put them. That's where they're gonna stay. So if you decide that you're gonna plant this hosta, you know, that hosta will grow, but it likes the shade and it's not going to grow um, and take over a space. And then once you plant it there, you probably know exactly where it's going to be next year and the next year. When you're in the shade, um, you have opportunities. You don't have a lot of flowering, but you have opportunities for color. Here you can see a coleus and this coleus has got some color in it. Doesn't have, you know, it does flower, but most people don't even like the flowers. I actually cut them off. And then you can see the color of this green. It's not as green as this leaf. And we have this leaf who's really, really green. And we have this one that is sort of a chartreuse green. And then uh, we have different textures. Notice the size of the leaf here. We've got a small leaf on this particular plant, a little bit medium-sized leaf, a large leaf, and then you get into the ferns, and the ferns, you know, create texture. So what you want to do in the shade, you want to combine these leaf textures along with color and form. Plants have different forms. This is a bush. This has obviously a have quite a different form than this particular plant. And I really have to get my muscle power up here. <laughs> this is a beautiful flowering plant. I'm going to tell you there are a few things that do actually flower in the shade. So we have different forms and you want to combine those to have a successful shade garden. Now, okay, I hate to talk about disadvantages because this is a shade presentation, but we got to get into the disadvantages. Um, if you are one of these people of a big piece of property and you know you have a low budget, you know these plants are not going to just take over the space. You know um, they are an investment, but once you get them where you want them, you, that's probably where they're going to stay. Um, and I told you the disadvantages. There aren't too many things that are going to give you you know this bang for your buck in color. Um, there you're going to have to explore other options, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, shade plants also like moisture. Um, so you got to run your hose or you have your irrigation system. You got to go back and you got to check on them, particularly like this particular week that you know, I'm giving this presentation. It's been very, very hot in the 90s. Uh, that sun's unrelenting and it provides the energy that the plant needs to grow, but it also dries up the soil. Shade plants normally are in the woods. What kind of soil is in the woods? Usually it's humusy organic soil. But if you live in a new subdivision and if you've been watching the building process, you know that they come up with their bobcats and their big heavy equipment and they just completely scour the earth and remove the topsoil. So if you're in a new subdivision, you're probably going to have to bring in some soil. You're going to be filling up your car with bags of soil. You're going to be getting a load of soil. You're going to be doing some amending. Okay, and notice that I have it in red. Soil must be amended. Most soil is not going to be that beautiful humusy soil. That's one of the topics, of course, that is coming up. All right. Types of soil. All right, here we go. I've got my companions here. I've got a bowl here that's clear. And this is the soil from my daughter's garden. She lives in a new subdivision. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. What's that soil look like? Well, if I was a plant, I don't know how happy I'd be being in the soil. We've got stones in there and it's clay. And when it gets really dry, it's like cement. And it's hard for the roots. My, pretend my fingers are roots and they're trying to get down in there. It's not the easiest job to get down in there. 
So what can we do? All right, they really like humus. So you go and you buy compost, compost manure. If you go to Lowe's, and I hate to just, you know, tell you that Lowe's is a good place, but you can get it for $2 and something, a bag of it. And what you need to do is mix that all together. And you don't want to completely get rid of that soil. I'm going to put my gardening gloves on. You want to get that soil, oh, and then now the plant says, whoa, the plant, the plant is now going to be happy because now it can really dig it root, its roots in there. And now it can, the magic word is grow. It's going to grow. And you put more nutrients in there. You might want to get, you know, a little bit of fertilizer. I would suggest you add some fertilizer. There's some fertilizer. You can put that in there. I should have brought that for you to take a look at. Um, so there we go. Now it's in much better shape. Um, I also would mention to you that um, one of the disadvantages of having a shade garden is deer. Let me show you an example. Here is a hosta. And you see that leaf? Something is wrong with that leaf. Hmm, something took a bite out of it. <laughs> Poor plant, something took a bite out of it. Well, what can you do? Well, I go out uh, like every two to three weeks and I spray. There is a spray and it really smells. It doesn't smell good at all. Um, it's a good thing I had an empty one because I have one that in my garage that smells really bad, but I couldn't bring it into the house. My house would be off, off base. No one, of, no one in my family would come to visit me. Okay, so let's move on. Um, what else can you do? Well, there's something called good bacteria. I think a lot of people, when they hear the word bacteria, all they think of is bad. Well, there's good bacteria. And if you've ever had an aquarium, aquariums need bacteria in order to function well. And also your soil. So that by putting the humus in there, you're adding the bacteria, the bacteria that you want, you want good bacteria. And there is something called um, mycorrhiza. And these are fungus. And they have done a lot of studies recently on the value of these fungus. These fungus, they attach to the roots and add more um, surface area so that they can go out and spread out and spread their wings out and get more nutrients. And so this would enhance their ability to grow. Again, the magic word is grow. And there are products that you can get, this particular one, I'm not you know, there are other products you can get as well. And notice this particular starter fertilizer does have those um, bacteria in there and the fungus, the mycorrhiza. Uh, fertilizing tips. Please keep this in mind. This is very, very important. Right now, plants are growing. In the spring is usually the time you want to give them fertilizer. Um, you can give them a little bit of fertilizer in the summer. But when it becomes fall, you don't want to over fertilize them in the fall because they are diminishing their growth. They're taking a rest. Winter's coming and you don't want them to put out a lot of growth and then get zapped by the winter weather. So you do half, um, you want to do about half of what it tells you on the package. Or may, some packages may actually tell you if it's fall, this is what to do. Now, a lot of people don't really understand this word, organic. This particular product, if you see there, it says organic. Well, what do we mean by organic? Well, being a science teacher, organic means anything with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in it. Or another way to put it is anything that has been produced by a living thing. So let's take a look at the ingredients in this particular organic product. What, what makes it organic? Okay, it has hydrolyzed feather meal. Feather comes from a bird, so that is organic. Pasteurized poultry manure. 
hmm, produced by a living thing, organic. Cocoa meal, hmm, plant, cocoa, you know, that's a plant. And so that is also organic. Alfalfa meal, there we go again. It's another uh, product of a plant and therefore it fits in our definition of organic. Now, to be organic, it doesn't have to be 100%. If you look at the government guidelines, you can throw some other things in here. So to make sure there's enough of these nutrients that the plant needs, they add potash um, and they also add some sulfur, okay, to that. And it fits the guidelines and the government's happy and I'm really pretty happy about that myself. Okay, so anyway, um, of course, the benefit is, you know, if you put in um, a, a slow releasing fertilizer, it's just not all going to be fed all at the same time. It will gradually provide that. And most plants that survive in the shade do like an acidic based fertilizer. So this will fit the category because it is on the acidic. It says this particular one is for acid loving plants such as rhododendron, uh, camellia, hydrangeas, um, gardenias, pastas, and so forth. Okay, moving on. Okay, additional shade considerations. Let's talk about dry shade, okay? Well, it seems like everything is dry right now because it happens to be July and um, we've been having 90 degree weather and it seems to be unrelenting, and that of course is gonna create shade. But think about those trees. They're the big guys. They're at the top of the pecking order, and so they get the rain and they get the moisture first. Anything that's around that tree is going to have to wait their turn. A tree wants what it wants, and then whatever's left over goes to those plants. So that creates dry shade. Also, under the eaves of a house, that rain may never reach that soil. Um, I've got some Leland spruces out in the side of my yard, and there's one spot on my driveway that I have a potted plant, and it never gets rain. Even if you have one of those violent storms like we had yesterday, it still gets zero rain, so I have to go out and water it almost every single day. Okay, if you mulch your soil, and that will help um, to allow more moisture to seep into the soil. So you also want to mulch. On top of this, if you put some mulch, mulch will hold and retain that water. So mulch not only makes it look good, people come out and you know, mulch their gardens because they want it to look good, but I will tell you there's other advantages. It also helps to retain the moisture. Okay, now, wet shade. All right, some shade is wet because it's near a stream, near a lake. Um, it could even be an air conditioning unit. My daughter has an air conditioning unit and the way that pipe comes out, you know, there's a section of her um, property that's very moist. And as a result, there's not a lot of things that really want to grow there, including the grass. Um, so you've got it not only take into consideration where you've got shade, but what type do you have? Do you have wet? Do you have dry? Um, now, if you have a really, really moist area and you want and you find that you're not getting a lot to grow, you can buy something. Um, there's two kind of products. One is called Permatil and another one's Mr. Nature. And I have some Mr. Nature right here. And Mr. Nature, has nutrients in it, soil in it, and it also has pieces of shale in it. And that, when you mix that in with your soil, that also makes happy plants. Particularly, as I said, now you wouldn't want to buy this product and spend the money for it because a bag of it's like nine bucks. But if you've got a very moist area, I would definitely make your plants happy and add that to your soil mixture. Okay, alrighty, let's move on. All right, this is one of the most important things. If you get nothing else out of this, this is the most important thing. You want to select the right plant for the right location. So, 
you sometimes, you know, go into um, nurseries and stores that are selling plants, and you will see again these little plant tags, and they'll tell you what zone. This zone is for zone seven through ten. Okay, what zone are we in? Hmm. Wonder what zone. Okay, so the people that are listening to this, if you live where I live, which is Georgia, if we look at the map, the zone in the northern portion of Georgia is zone seven. And in the south, it's eight. And now we have on top of that, we have had some very unusually warm winters and warm summers. And so some people are saying areas that are seven are now eight, eights are now nines. But every few years, you get one of these very, very severe winters. And that is why I'm gonna tell you that Fulton County has uh, most of Fulton County, the northern portion of Fulton County is 7B and the southern portion of Fulton County is seven, is um, no, eight. So here's a better look at Fulton County. And you can see that way up in the northern portion of Fulton County, the zones change. But I would all, anything that says zone seven, I think is safe. Sometimes you'll see a plant that says zone eight. Well, if you have zone eight, hopefully you're in the southern portion of Fulton County or you have a very protected area that um, is close to the house because the heat of the house sometimes will supplement um, and prevent that ground from getting really um, cold. And so sometimes if you've got plants that are close to the house, you can get away with an eight. But about five, seven years ago, we had a really, really severe winter. I had something called a, an Indian hawthorn growing as a foundation plant. Every single one of them died. I took out over 30. I have a uh, large property and I took out over 30 of them. And if you go and you look at Indian hawthorn, which they sell in the garden centers, it says zone eight, starting at zone eight. So just beware. All right. Um, Getting back to, you know, these beautiful gardens, take a look at that picture. That's an inspiration right there. Always stay positive about your shade garden. Uh, remember, shade is not a problem. It's an opportunity. Um, too much shade does not mean that your garden cannot be attractive. I have some very, very deep shade. And by using texture, you want to use texture and using various shades of green, it's still an appealing garden. I can walk back there with friends and I can, you know, show them, you know, the fruits of my labor. Now, this is what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> we finally got there, components of a shade garden. I'm going to be talking about trees, shrubs, perennials, and annuals. One of my favorite spring trees is the red bud. It is a native. So if you're into natives, the red bud is a native. And I go down 400 quite a bit. And in the spring, I love to see all the red buds that are blooming along 400. Now they've been making 400, increasing the number of lanes, and they've been cutting some of them back. But um, it's definitely a beautiful sight to see those. Um, I went uh, on a trip uh, back to Pennsylvania where I was living uh, before I came to Georgia and I went through Virginia at the absolute prime time for red buds. They were everywhere. They're absolutely exquisite trees and I love the shape of the leaf. Look at it. Shape of a heart. Dogwood. Who doesn't love dogwood? We even have a dogwood festival in Georgia and the native ones are white um, and you can also get a hybrid that's pink. And then there is, and those bloom usually like April. And then you've got your Kusa dogwood that blooms usually a little bit later. That is um, not a native. It comes from, I think, Korea or Japan or one of those locations. But dogwood is a native again. So if you're into natives, um, you want to get a white dogwood. And they will take um, partial sun even. In fact, they will probably bloom better if they get partial sun. You don't want to put them in complete shade. They will, they will live, but they won't bloom. Uh, varieties of spice of life. 
You might want to add a shrub, and here's a shrub that will definitely do well. That's your hydrangeas, and there are hundreds of varieties of hydrangeas, and I don't have time to talk about them all. But um, here's a beautiful blue one. They come in white, they come in pink, and the soil, um, if it is acidic, they'll be blue. If it's basic, they will be pink sometimes, and the white ones get white, they'll probably be white forever. But the blue ones can actually, if you've got basic soil, can turn into pink. And the pink ones, in my case, since I've got acidic soil, it's hard to keep a pink. All right, um, moving into azaleas. Azaleas will take some shade. They're evergreen. I mean, what's not to love about an azalea? They're evergreens. The deer don't eat them. Um, they bloom pro prolifically in the spring, and they have some new varieties now that bloom supposedly all the time, but that's not true. They usually bloom very well in the spring and very well in the fall, and then they may have a few blooms here or there. I have some right now that are blooming. Maybe there's like five on them. And then we can't talk about azaleas without talking about native azaleas. And native azaleas actually have a different kind of flower. They're different genus and species. Um, and they require some shade. They do well in par partial sun, partial shade. And they are not evergreen. They will lose their leaves. So they're quite different from the natives or from the other azaleas. All right, again, as I said, um, native azaleas are not evergreens. Uh, evergreen, that means that they lose their leaves in the fall and will not get their leaves again until spring. Now, azaleas will even grow in the north. There is a different kind of azalea that blooms down here, and they are hardy in plant zones six through nine. Once you get past nine, you go into Florida, and they don't do it too well. They're not happy campers. They don't want too much sun. They like partial shade to partial sun. They do want, you know, more sun than, um, there actually are some varieties now that will even take the sun. They like acidic soil. They like good drainage. They do not like to have wet feet. So again, you might want to get this stuff with the shale in it and get it in there so you can grow those azaleas. So don't overwater them. So if you have irrigation, don't over irrigate them either. Um, now, if you are wanting an azalea, and this is a shade garden thing, so I probably shouldn't even mention this, but if you want an azalea that's sun tolerant, the Encore azaleas, the ones that bloom several times a year, those are the ones to buy. Now, getting into some of my favorites, um, one is the Daphne. Daphne, and I love its scientific name, it's Daphne odora. It has a beautiful odor. So it's evergreen, it's deer resistant, um, it's a bloomer. It's got a, if you like pink, it is a pink bloomer and um, it blooms really early. So if you're one of these people that are getting, you know, at the point you've just said, I just don't want another winter day and you're looking for some relief from the winter, they bloom very early. They bloom in February and in March. Um, they like zone seven through nine. So if you have a mountain home um, in North Georgia or somewhere out of the state, um, it's zone seven through nine. They are not happy being in the North. All right, here you can see this leaf is a little different than the leaf in the previous one. This little one has a little bit of a white margin to it. Um, I found this little quote about Daphne, and I love the little quote. I'm gonna share it with you. They're finicky, they're persnickety, they're difficult, and I'll tell you why. They're also magnificent, wonderful, and irresistible. I love this plant and cannot imagine my garden without it. Now, some people are on the side of the finicky, persnickety, and difficult because sometimes they just don't take. Um, I've been lucky. Uh, the ones I've planted have all grown, but other people tell me otherwise. So take that into account. There are some places like Pikes, like Lowe's, like Home Depot, that you can keep your receipt. And if the plant doesn't grow, they will give you your money back. So 
you might want to buy Daphne from one of those places and hold on to your receipt because Lowe's now says you have to have a receipt and you have to have the original pot. Um, so there we go. All right, here's another favorite. Oh my gosh. More secrets for creating fragrant shade garden. How do you get a shade garden with fragrance? Try gardenia. They do like some sun though. They are like partial sun, partial shade. Uh, if you put them in the shade, they'll die or they just won't even flower at all. Now, one thing about gardenias, they're evergreen, they're deer resistant, they have a fragrance. What is there not to love about them? And they come in different sizes. Here's a little dwarfy guy. This is gardenia uh, radicans, and they only get about two feet tall. And so if you want one that's hugging the ground, that's pretty much, you know, um, they also would do well if you have a hillside and you've got a brick wall that's holding the hillside up and you put them right at the edge, they can kind of drift down on the hillside. I've seen that in gardens, they're beautiful. Um, then you've got the smaller version to middle size version that gets three to four feet. Um, these, I'm gonna, this word dwarf, get rid of that word. They're actually small. They have a fragrant white flower. This one is the most cold tolerant. So if you are in zone 7A and sometimes the winters get, you know, up in the mountains get pretty severe, I would suggest the frost proof. Of all the gardenias on the market, this is the one to buy. And here's the flower. It has very appealing flowers. Some of them are single and some are double flowers. And this one is one that's kind of on the double side. All right, let's see what else we have. And this one is the taller version. You get a taller one and look at the flower. The flower is gonna be bigger and it's a double. And this is the most popular one. This is the one that you find at almost every garden center that sells gardenias are going to have this particular one. They're gonna, it's gonna get five to six feet tall. Moving on to another type of shrub. This is the hydrangea. And I wish I had time to even get into it. But if you go to the North Fulton Gardner YouTube programs, you will find that we already have a wonderful program on hydrangeas. And you can see they are just, I love them. I can't have enough of them. <laughs> so if anybody in my family asks me what I want as a gift, I say, I want a hydrangea. It's lovely. All right, so you've got the oak leaf type and you've got the um, type that I just showed you in the previous slide. This is an oak leaf. They get more of a um, cylindrical one, um, conal type, very big white flower. Um, there is one version, it's not the oak leaf, but there is a white hydrangea that's blooming right now in July. Um, and they can take some sun. Most of the time they want some shade and if they don't get enough shade, they will start to get groupy really, really, really fast. They like moisture. As I said before, a lot of shade plants are very moisture needy. And uh, hydrangeas definitely fit the bill. If you buy a new hydrangea, you've got to water it like every day, every other day if you buy it in the summer because you, they'll tell you that they need water. Hydrangea is not going to sit there and it, they, can, they speak to you because their leaves get very droopy. All right, moving on, camellias. Okay, I've been talking about things that bloom in the spring, things that bloom in the summer. Well, if you want something that actually blooms um, in the late winter and early spring, you might want to think about camellias and they come in a, a large variety. And look at all the different colors. They have, you know, different size flowers. Some have larger flowers, some have smaller flowers, some are pink, some are rose colored, some are purple, some are white, some are mixture, some of them almost look like a candy cane. So, you know, if you like camellias, you know, explore all your options. And again, I don't have time to go into all the details. All right, now, one of my favorite plants, because I've got so much deep shade, is hostas. Hostas will tolerate very deep shade. And you can mix them. They look really nice when you have shade. You want to have texture. You want to have depth. You want to have form, differences in form. And look at that combination, how appealing. Oops, how did that happen? <laughs> um, so there you can see how you can mix 
different things in the shade, your hydrangeas with your hostas. And you can see this hosta is blooming. They bloom now. This is the blooming time, June and July. And the reason I love hydrangeas and I love um, hostas that they come in so many varieties. So I picked this picture because I don't have time to discuss a lot about hosta. I could do a whole program on hostas because they are so um, varied. There's a lot of diversity. You can see here's a blue one. There's a green one. Here is a one that's half white and half green. Here is a chartreuse one. Some have big leaves, some have little leaves. There's even one called a curly fry that has a literally has a curly Q kind of leaf. So um, I have about 75 varieties. I used to have more, but the deer have helped themselves to a few of them. They do need this product. Don't buy hostas unless you buy this product. Unless you've got a fenced in area, if you have a fenced in area, then you can be a happy camper without that. Moving on. Okay, hostas do produce flowers, but that's not the reason that people plant them. They plant them basically for the leaf. Here you can see in a very appealing blue one, and then it has a purple flower. Some of them have white flowers. And again, look at those different leaves. Lots of different texture in the leaves too. And here is a sample of a beautiful shade garden. Notice the trees here that are creating the shade. Here you can see a fern, you can see a huge gorgeous hosta and some more ferns and some other plants. And then another thing I like to do is put stones in with and mix them in because just to create variety. Here you can see this was my sister's garden when she lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. Here you can see there's a bird bath. I have little trinkets in my garden. My husband never liked them too much. My garden art, just to give some variety because again, there's not, you know, when you're in the shade, there's not a lot of options, not a lot of colors. So you might want to get color in there with a little garden art. Now, here is another plant that likes shade. Hallelujah, here's another plant and look at this. Not only are you getting a plant that likes shade, Check it out, it flowers. These are called Lenten roses or hellebores is the scientific name. And they also, not only are they appealing, they are appealing because of when they flower. They flower when nothing else is flowering. These guys, I don't know why they like the winter. I don't I'll have to do some scientific research. They're about the only plant I know that wants to flower in the winter. I mean, there's some shrubs that'll, that'll flower in the winter in this early spring, but these guys, that's their glory days in the winter. And leaving my glory day plants, my Lenten roses, I also have something that I have nicknamed. I don't know, this is probably nothing that it's in the literature, but I call them the polka dot plants. Cause look, when you have the shade, you've got to create variety. And there's a variety in the shape of the leaf and in those little polka dots. And then in the spring, they reward you with these pretty blue flowers that fade into pink in the spring only. So they aren't gonna flower all summer long. There really is nothing out there that I know that flowers continuously. And here are stilbe. Okay, in the perfect world, my stilbees would look like this. <laughs> a stilbees like it a little cooler than it is in Georgia. You go into the, nurseries, you see these beautiful things, you say, oh, I've got to have this for my shade garden, but I do want to put a warning up. They um, need a lot of water, a lot of love, a lot of care. You got to talk to them. You got to say, I want you to flower this year because they can be very temperamental. Well, going from temperamental to one that isn't temperamental, and that is a Solomon seal. Again, this plant amazed me. My sister has it. And she planted it. I told her, don't plant it in the sun. You know what she did? She planted it in the sun. Told her not to. She did it anyway. Guess what? I just learned that Solomon Seal will survive in partial sun. And notice this, this um, Solomon Seal on the one side here is green. On the other side, we've got one that's got a white edge to it. And as a little bonus, <laughs> 
doesn't happen very long, but for like a couple weeks in the spring, it will get these little teeny bell-shaped flowers. But don't count on them to survive more than a couple weeks. But it's very appealing because it grows in the shade, it creates texture, it creates form, and uh, I highly recommend it. All right, what can we do about fall? Well, there's not a lot going on in most gardens in the fall, and you're probably thinking, hmm, what's going to happen in my shade garden in the fall? Well, I'll tell you a lot. <laughs> you're going to still have all that green, though. Those hosses are going to be rewarding you with their texture. The ferns are going to be rewarding you. But you can get some flowers going with this perennial, and it will come back up year after year. It's called an anemone. Okay, and I've got them and they do multiply. So you can give them to your friends. And what do we all love? If we love shade, what do we love? We love ferns because ferns will take practically no light. They survive. They figured out a way to do it in the very deep shade. And what my recommendation would be would be the autumn fern. It does very well. By that, um, don't get, you know, you see other varieties, but I've tried them and I will tell you autumn fern is the one to buy. Now, I love, love, love this Japanese painted fern. For me, in my deep shade, I think it likes a little bit more sun than I have. Um, some people do very well with it. I don't seem to do that well with it. And the, maybe it's because of the deer, I don't know. I should have a camera out there and observe those deer when they come and feast in my garden. But I went out this morning to cut a leaf off a Japanese painted fern and I couldn't find anything except one little sickly looking one that only had two leaves. Needless to say, I just could not cut a leaf off of it. But look at the color. Again, when we're in the shade, we're looking for color, we're looking for texture. And the texture in a fern is just exquisite. You can't find better texture than in a fern. Now, natives. We love natives, don't we? Okay, let's take a look. This is a native, and it's an easy one to remember the name of it because it's called the Christmas fern. Why? Because it is not totally evergreen, but it's not totally evergreen, but it will um, it will continue to be green at Christmas time. That's why it's called a Christmas fern. And here is my autumn fern. The autumn fern dies back by Christmas time. It's, it's not there anymore. And there is another native, which is called a lady fern. It's got a more delicate leaf than this one. I couldn't find any in my garden, but this is looking like, you know, pretty much like it. So there we go. There are different kinds of ferns. And the two that are natives that you will find just growing out there, you know, volunteers, if you've got a forest out beyond your house, um, you'll probably find, or if you go hiking, these are the two that you're going to find predominantly in the Georgia forest. Lady fern and that. Oh, all right. Well, there's always a sad story. You know, I can't all tell you happy stories. This is a very sad, sad story. I used to plant probably hundreds of impatience in my shade garden in Pennsylvania. And this impatience, um, Wallariana, is one of those plants that has succumbed to a disease called downy mildew. This downy mildew is a fungus. It reproduces by spores. The spores enter the air and are transmitted through the air. And they found this mildew, I think, originally in England about 10 years ago. And within 10 years, due to the air currents throughout the globe, it has managed to find its way into every single country, county, state in the U.S. and elsewhere. And these particular kinds of impatients you may find them in garden centers, but if you bring them home, they'll probably grow for about a, a month. And then one day they just belly up and die. It's just the saddest thing to see these impatience. And they grow and they bring color to a shade garden. And they were very cheap. They was the most popular of all the annuals. 
So the gardeners were not real happy with this. The, the garden centers made a lot of money on these. Um, so what do I have as they suggest? <laughs> I need a muscle band. Okay, here's a suggestion. This also is an impatience. Guess what? Thank goodness the downy mildew only attacks the other kind of impatience. This is a New Guinea impatience, and it is it thrives now because it doesn't get that downy mildew. Um, what's the name of that plant? Oh. Uh, crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle gets the downy mildew, but it's only specific to crepe myrtle. No other plants will get it. Same thing is true here. This is only going to attack this one particular genus and species of impatience. All right, well, we're getting to the end of our presentation, and I just want to tantalize you with this beautiful garden, the shade garden here, and see what you can create. Um, and that's my presentation, and I just want to tell you these are the highlights, the main points that I want to go over with you. These are the main points. I have them on a flower. Let me go over them with you. Okay, number one, observe. Look for shadows. Number two, plan for future, the future because your garden will grow. Okay, and the shade is not going to grow as much as it would in other places. Number three, be prepared to move plants as trees grow. Okay, as trees grow, they're creating more shadows. Provide more, that will provide more shade. And as perennials grow and multiply, you're going to have to maybe divide them and give them to friends and neighbors. All right, number four, power of three. When you're decorating, remember this in the house or in the garden, power of three. If you put three stones in one place, three hostas in one place, three of anything in one place, it really gives that pop. So um, even clusters of three, threes, fives, sevens, and so forth, add to interest and visual appeal. All right, <laughs> denuding my flower. All right, number five. Weeds. Weeds can, can't flourish without room to grow. Mulch. Mulch, mulch, mulch. Mulch helps you retain the moisture and it keeps the weeds down. All right. Oh, here's one of my favorites. Amend the soil. Remember, amend the soil or you're not going to have good results. Not in Georgia, at least with our soil. soil. Oh, we're getting down. I'm denuding it down. All right, number seven. Trees fall down. Sometimes I was out in the garden two days ago. It's a good thing that I was not where this tree decided to fall over. A huge, like 75 year old oak tree fell. Well, if that was in my yard, that meant that all of a sudden the shade garden would become a sun garden. So remember that. All righty. And last but not least, as I said, this is the most important, and notice I have it in red plant the right plant in the right location. Voila, we are basically finished. Here are some references that you can look at. I'm not gonna go over each one of them, but I stole some pictures from some of them. Um, being a master gardener, I do wanna mention that the University of Georgia Extension has a variety of publications. And also I do wanna mention that there's gold star rewards these are plants that were selected by the University of Georgia um, and that do well in this climate. Here are some books. Again, I'll let you take a look at this. And there are phone apps. So check it out. You can, there are some phone apps that tell you if you take a picture of a plant, it'll identify the genus and species. Some are better than others. Caution. Check them out. You may want to go with them and may not. All right, moving on, um, who are the master gardeners? Okay, being a master gardener, let me tell you a little bit about master gardeners. The main mission of the master gardeners is to provide education. That's why I'm doing this program. Um, we also want to inspire you to grow plants. Um, and we service um, a number of historic sites. We help them with their gardens. Uh, we support 
um, demonstration gardens. We go to farmers markets. We work with children um, in their schools, in different environments, helping children with gardening classes. And um, we provide scholarships. We do have once a year, we have a fundraiser. It's at Bullock Hall and it is called the Garden Fair. And it's in conjunction with the Roswell Azalea Festival. It is the last Saturday in April, and I highly encourage you to go to support us, and you'll love the plants that you can find there. We have pass along plants that we do, and this is our one and only, I want to stress, uh, fundraiser so that we can then take care of these historic gardens, these children events, these other events that we do. Um, and then, you know, we provide gardening education through these lectures, which you um, have to sat through one of them. And uh, we have more, if you like this one, we've got one on hydrangeas. We are having some developed on other topics. And so please tune in to our new topics. Um, future classes, as I said, they're free. All you have to do is, you know, tune in to YouTube. Um, the, um, we've got a Facebook page, we've got a Twitter page, we're developing um, Instagram, we have a web page, and we have a YouTube channel. And we have some very active, technologically savvy people who are doing a fabulous job for us. And so I'm going to have to bid you adieu. This is it. Bye-bye.